Hello, and welcome back to another session of For the Good of the Game. My name is John Davis, JD, and I'm your host, and we have a very special guest tonight. We're going to be having a great conversation with uh, Nathan McPeak. Coach McPeak is the head coach of the Frederick Douglass Broncos in Lexington, Kentucky. He, uh, he actually played football at Russell High School here in Kentucky and then went on to play a full college career at Marshall University, where he earned his undergrad degree. Uh, went on to get a master's as well before at Moorhead State before uh, getting full blown uh, into the coaching business. He is 70 and 15 in seven seasons as a head coach and was recently named uh, to coach in the uh, Adidas All American Bowl, which unfortunately, like a lot of the other events of that nature, uh, had been put on hold because of uh, COVID. So, congrats on that piece, coach. He's, uh, he's actually coached at uh, Boyd County and Fairview High School here in Kentucky. He was at Tucker High School in Atlanta, Georgia, for several seasons. Uh, did a short stint at Bryan Station, where our, our uh, mutual friend is now the head coach, and, uh, and then has been at Frederick Douglass since 2017. Uh, he has had the pleasure of coaching 20 plus athletes who have made it to the next level at Division One. And uh, I, I want to get into to all of that, but Coach, I uh, I want to say thank you for taking the time to be here, and uh, really appreciate you being on with us tonight. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Davis, for having me. It's a, it's a really pl- uh, honor to be on here. Um, I've actually listened to some of your other podcasts that you've done in the past and really think you do an outstanding job on just touching on a lot of life concepts and and all of those great things that we need to continue to talk about with, with sports. And so it's an honor to be here tonight. So thank you. Well, I appreciate it. Appreciate you taking the time. It's, uh, it, you know, the, the season one um, was uh, about life skills and, and uh, football insights and life skills. And season two, we're kind of focused on relationships. And as I was telling you off camera before we started, one thing that grabbed my attention was the other day, uh, I saw you post uh, on social media, a graphic that showed uh, all the different schools where uh, Frederick Douglass Bronco athletes have been recruited. And I, I, I like to explore relationships from every angle, but certainly from the recruiting standpoint. So I want to start there. Um, and then I want to get into a little bit of your career and see how your career, particularly uh, the, the relationships you had while you're playing at Marshall, influenced you, you know, for what you do now. So starting off, when you talk about college recruiting as a high school football head coach, um, what do you think is kind of the most important set of things that you talk about with your young players as they, uh, you know, show that they've got the potential to play at the next level? And what, what do you advise them on to, to start those, you know, those processes in place? Yeah, well, the first thing is obviously they have to have the talent. Uh, that goes without saying, uh, whether it's a major power five school, uh, you know, SEC, ACC, you know, Big 12 or all the way down to NAIA. You know, a lot of people assume that just because you play football, you can play at NAIA school. Well, that's far from the truth. Um, a very small percentage of high school players are gonna go play college football. It's uh, under 8% uh, from NAIA all the way up to D1. So the numbers, you know, are not huge. So that's first thing is, you know, do they have the talent? Do they have the skill set? And is it going to be developed? And to me, that's my job. I got to develop that talent. I got to develop them into being a young man off the field and on the field. Um, but football recruiting has changed a lot over the years. It, it has and it hasn't. And, you know, I'm going into year 18 myself, um, you know, for coaching and teaching and um, you know, it's changed a little bit in the fact that, you know, basketball used to be in basketball recruiting started really, really early, you know, right. eighth, eighth, ninth grade. Football was really not that way for, for a long time. Uh, football was kind of later developing, you know, junior, senior year. Uh, and, and, you know, colleges would kind of jump in late on kids. You don't see that as much anymore. You see it, but not not as prevalent as it used to be, in my opinion. Uh, so what I tell, for for example, my income in 2025 class, um, you know, I'll tell, th- I'll meet with them and the parents and say it starts now. 
your car, your, your recruiting profile starts as soon as you enter high school. Uh, your GPA is really important, obviously. Uh, that freshman year GPA, I can't tell you how many kids over the years that tell me when they're a senior, they regret not doing better their freshman year. Um, so I really share that with our, our players, our incoming freshmen, that that clock starts then. Uh, because, you know, the higher those grades are, the more doors and opportunities uh, that they're going to have, not only in football, but for academic money and scholarship. Sure. sure. Um, so I think it starts there. Colleges are looking, uh, especially your bigger programs, they're looking at kids now that are, are two years or three years uh, until they graduate. Um, I've actually had universities already ask me about my 2024 class, which were freshmen this year. They're going to be sophomores, um, you know, and, and, and that to me, that's changed a little bit. It wasn't always that way. Uh, you didn't have schools asking that. So the timetable has kind of ramped up a little bit. Uh, with that being said, it doesn't mean that kids can't develop uh, into their junior and senior years and get college football scholarships. That happens a lot. But what I tell them is, and what they need to understand, sometimes at 14 years old, 15, that's not, you know, the best thing they're thinking of. <laughs> sure. I feel, like, I feel like it's my job to make them aware of that process. Um, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no. I, I, I wanted to interject here because I, I, uh, I've seen it on both sides of the fence. I had a friend of mine one time who happened to be a – end up being a professional baseball player talk about that. He, um, he was cleaning out his head coach's office one day after his senior year. And he found a bunch of recruiting letters, letters in the drawer that the coach had never shown him, never given him. And he actually got recruited to play college baseball because of a, an opposing coach at another high school. When you talk about when you, and I love the fact that you said the parents, in addition to the players, when you sit down with those freshmen, when you talk about, setting your schedule for each class and what you're going to get involved in, how much time can you afford to take or do you carve out of your schedule to actually begin to build those dialogues with schools that may inquire or schools that you think a, uh, an athlete may be able to play at? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I enjoy that. It does take a lot of my time. Um, you know, I'm lucky in the fact that, you know, I, I work for some administrators in our building that understand that. Um, and they understand that colleges are going to come in and, and want to see our young men in our building. Uh, and I'm lucky in the fact that, again, my bosses understand that that's part of the process. Uh, that's going to maybe take me away from something that I have to do with my class to show college coaches to our young men. Obviously, this past year has been vastly different with COVID. That's sure. not allowed right now. But in a typical regular year, it's going to be a very busy time at Frederick Douglass High School in January and February uh, before colleges start spring practice. Um, it does take a lot of time. For example, the last couple of weeks for me have been spent a lot of time on email, Twitter, and phone calls about our, our prospects. Um, and, and that's good. I want to help kids get to where their dreams become realities. Um, with that being said, you know, I enjoy that piece. Um, some head coaches uh, will have other coaches on their staff handle it. Um, I don't do that as much myself um, because I enjoy it. I, I enjoy the relationships of all the college coaches because at the end of the day, they're going to call me anyway and ask about that kid as the head coach. Uh, but um, one thing that I did for, you know, our old head coach, uh, Coach Landis, that left to take a college football job, um, is, you know, I did all the profiles for our kids and I took that off his plate. Uh, and, and the reason I did that is because I enjoy it. Um, and, and I have a lot of connections in college football. Um, you know, so do people that I know. If I don't know them, I probably know somebody that does uh, really across the country. Um, so I think those opportunities are going to be there uh, for our young men at Douglas because we do have a good relationship. Uh, with a lot of college coaches. And I think that starts with honesty. Um, for example, I'm not going to recommend a kid to Ohio State that probably doesn't match what Ohio State wants. I'm not going to waste that coach's time. Um, and that's no discredit to whatever kid wants to go to Ohio State. It's just 
you know, they're going to look at X amount of players in the whole country. Um, so I feel like I'm pretty honest uh, with our college coaches uh, to not waste their time with prospects. Do you feel, I mean, I'm going to kind of jump back and forth here because I enjoyed, uh, you know, kind of looking at your career and everything. I mean, in the years you played at Marshall, uh, I think Coach Pruitt was the head coach the whole time you were there. Um, yes, and, uh, I mean, you guys had a really good run during the period of time you were there. It didn't hurt that you had a guy named Leftwich playing quarterback for you for the first three years you were there. But um, yes. you had a, a lot of talented guys. I mean, that school – in the, the two seasons of being 11 and two winning conference championships, you guys had several players go to the NFL. You yourself had a look from the Packers. Um, when you start talking about the relationships that you built playing at a program like Marshall, who that has had a, a ton of notoriety, uh, unfortunately, some because of tragedy, but um, you know, the, the, a lot of notoriety in terms of the success that that program has had as a mid level major first, and then it grew up and it kind of became, you know, really a premier program. Um, how much have you used either with coaches you played for or with players you played with relationships in that to do what you were just talking about with, you know, building those associations and being able to get the word out on some of your athletes to help them out? Yeah, I think it starts there. Uh, I think you hit the you know nail on the head there. Um, you know, I, I think it starts there. There's a lot of college coaches that coach me or were associated with our program that are still coaching in college football. Uh, coach Pruitt's now retired, uh, but there's not ever a time that I'll ask him for help or if he knows somebody at universities that he won't reach out. Uh, he's he's a really good guy. Uh, he was an excellent coach to play for, but. A lot of coaches that I coached uh, that coach me or, or have branches of Marshall football are scattered really across the country. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that's that been, you know, because Marshall was a, what is a program that, you know, some coaches can really stair step into bigger paydays or bigger jobs because it's a program that's really loved in the community because of the tragedy. And Marshall's going to give every avenue and resource they can to win football games. Uh, and in turn, that means that you're going to lose good coaches. Um, so a lot of coaches that, that I know have branched out to bigger programs or they're associated with other programs. And it kind of started there for me a few years ago in the recruiting piece. And then from there, just kind of branched out into, hey, you know, Coach McPeak's going to tell me the truth about these kids. He's not going to lie to me. Um, you know, he's not going to waste my time. And to me, that's really important, um, you know, in building that trust and rapport to where they will come back. Um, you know, we had a young man sign at Clemson uh, two years ago, Walker Parks, that got to play a little bit this year at Clemson. You know, obviously, it'd be great to have a Clemson player every year, uh, but that's probably not going to be the case. But I'm not going to – I'm going to always have that relationship to text their coaches, how you doing today, just wanted to ask how you're doing today, coach. I hope your family's doing well. And I feel like that's a strength of mine. I, I check up on people quite often um, and just, you know, let them know that, hey, I'm still here. So when we do have kids that can play at a Clemson or, or at a Kentucky or wherever that is, that they'll always come back and, and they'll always be part of our program. Uh, and I think that's important. Um, because I want future Broncos in our program to have the best opportunities that they can have. But yeah, Marshall's definitely a key in that uh, to start out with recruiting for sure. How did you, uh, you know, you already talked about the, the advantage or at least the, the, uh, the fact that you enjoy playing for Coach Pruitt. He certainly enjoyed a great reputation and, um, and had a lot of success. Uh, how much of what you took away from playing for the Thundering Herd, do you incorporate or have you incorporated, or did you tend to just align it more with a philosophy and, and really try to build around what Nathan McPeak wanted to bring to Frederick Douglass as, you know, as head coach of the Broncos? Yeah, I think it, it take, I mean, that's a great question. Um, I've kind of taken a little bit from everybody I've really ever played for. Um, I come from a football family. Uh, my grandfather is still living. He's, he's in his mid-80s. He started our youth program uh, in our hometown, uh, which uh, in our JFL program. Um, and he's always been, he was a referee for a long time with football and was always around. And my uncle was a head football coach in the state of Kentucky for over 20 years. So as I was growing up, I always went to his games. Um, my dad coached me in Little League. He never coached me on that. But 
football was always important. My mom loved football because uh, it was important to me and our family. Uh, so I've always been kind of a football junkie. Uh, I've always been, football has been part of my DNA my whole life. And I knew when I was done playing that that's what I wanted to do. Uh, and that kind of married in to teaching because the schedules align out with that with high school. Um, so I got my degree in that, but I, I took a lot from a lot of different people. Um, but particularly with Coach Pruitt, um, just the overall confidence that you have to have to be a winning program. You know, Coach Pruitt wasn't cocky, but he was confident. And he knew that we had good players, and he knew that we were going to go out and win every game. If we didn't win, it wasn't because it wasn't uh, off our mindset. It was because, you know, obviously there's something in the game that we didn't do well. Um, so I feel like that part of that winning culture has helped me in my career on what the components of winning are and what that looks like. Um, you know, I never had a losing season in college. Uh, we always won, as you said, championships, or we were always competing for championships. And you got to have you got to have good players. I mean, that, that's sure. part of any, any any team, but in football, it, it really helps. Good players make you good coaches for sure. Um, but um, that's really the biggest thing. I mean, I learned a lot of life lessons and our core values and all those things that we use with our young men. Uh, but Coach Pruitt always had a good relationship with his players. I think he talked to us like, and respected us like young men, but he'd get after us if we weren't living up to our expectation and we weren't being the best version of ourselves. Uh, and I think all that translates in, in coaching today to be the best version of yourself and building those relationships. Yeah, I agree. In fact, there's something that has been um, surprisingly refreshing for me. Uh, and, and I know that, you know, of course, so much during COVID, so much of the communication, whether it's casual or professional, has been through social media and email. And, uh, you know, I certainly follow a lot of coaches, uh, both in and outside the state of Kentucky, um, having been blessed to have a lot of relationships like yourself, not as as a player. I played in AI college football for a couple of years prior to joining the military. But it's uh, you, you you see something that I think has been born out of the pandemic challenge, and that is coaches are readily sharing information whether it be their schemes offensively and defensively, uh, off-season training programs. I, I mean, it is amazing to me, having grown up in an era where coaches tend to be very close to the chest, you know, they didn't want to share their stuff, which always surprised me because, um, you know, I mean, it, it, it to me, it never really mattered if anybody knew you ran the wing tee or the power eye or whatever you did you know, you still had the advantage of knowing what play you were running. You had to be better at them to run in the play than they were at defending it. But I see that. Do you think that, again, going back to relationships, that that's been born out of this pandemic, that guys are more willing to share because they realize the value in just helping each other and helping get better as a group as well as individuals? Yeah, I think you, I think again, you know, that, that that's spot on. Uh, I can't tell you how many great relationships I've made off of Zooms and social media over the last 12 months, all right, and, and made some really good friends. And one thing that I was going to talk about in the relationships, and you kind of segued into that, is mm -hmm. I've been fortunate enough to be really, really, really close with seven other head coaches in other states. Uh, we kind of have a mantra of the seven states mafia. Um, but <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So uh, there's a coach in Georgia. There's a coach in Illinois. There's a coach in, obviously, here, me, Kentucky. Uh, there's a coach in Kansas. There's a coach in Idaho. There's a coach in California. And there's a coach in Washington. Hmm. And there's seven of us that have been social media. And we, we have an app called Marco Polo where we're a group. Uh, video together and we share ideas and we talk daily. We've got to meet each other's families through that. Um, actually, two of those guys have couldn't play in the fall in those states that have come watch us play in the fall. Uh, I'm going to return the favor in a couple weeks and go watch Illinois play at a high school there. Um, so, 
you know, we've got a chance to become really good friends because we have the commonality of being head football coaches at high schools and just bouncing those ideas off each other. And we've become really, really close. Over, we met last March, uh, late March, early April, I believe. So it's been almost a year. Uh, and we talk almost every day. And that would have never happened without COVID. Um, you know, so as bad as those things happened uh, with all the, the stuff we've had to deal with and we all know the struggles and, and the adversities, there have been a lot of positives for me personally with that. But also, as you're saying, with coaches sharing more and more ideas, I've got a lot of great things that I can use for the future. I think that's tremendous. That's a great story. And, and I think maybe what I was seeing, not in your case, because obviously that's a, you know, using a, a special app as kind of a private group. But what I'm seeing publicly, openly, is, is guys sharing. And there's always been guys that have had uh, – you know, like we, we had uh, Coach Kenny Simpson, who's now at Searcy High School in Arkansas. He's he we had him on the show last year and he has always been very forthright in putting his stuff out. I mean, he's the, of the, the schemes he uses, how he coaches. He's written books. He's just one of those prolific guys that is uh, a real educator when it comes to the profession. And I think that's wonderful. Uh, and so there's always been guys like that, but to do the kind of thing you just described to me, that is super special. And that kind of thing, uh, wh whether the pandemic, you know, whether it may have happened, you know, uh, serendipity without the pandemic or not is really immaterial. The fact that it did happen is, is kudos to you guys and that you've taken advantage of it. And, you know, obviously it's, it's a little bit unique on the positive side because being in different States, it's not like you guys are, you know, one of you is down the street and, they're, they're in, you know, they're, you're going to play them in the regional. So, you know, I mean, but there's a, I just, it has always bothered me <clears throat> the degree, excuse me, the degree to which guys have guarded their stuff when the reality is, you know, it, it, there's not a whole lot new that's been developed from year to year in football. It, it stuff gets renamed and twisted around and there's, you know, you, you can go from 11 to 21 personnel and you can do this or that and have a motion or a, a weight aside and make everything look different, but it's still, you know, 34 dive or 34 counter or whatever, you, you know, th we ran way back in the day when I rode my dinosaur to football practice and wore leather helmets. So, you know, it's, uh, it's just one of those things. What do you think? Um, it, it, look back on what you've done, not just at Frederick Douglass as a head coach, but in, in the almost 20 years that you've been coaching and certainly your, your seven seasons as a head coach, um, how do you choose to incorporate either input and or personal visits with your alumni from schools that you've coached at? Have you gotten guys involved in those type of relationships to help bolster, you know, whether it's the attitude or a message or whatever? Yeah, I mean, I think that's important to Douglas. You know, we don't have a huge alumni base because we're a new school, mm -hmm. you know, we're year five. Uh, but one thing that I want to try to do this fall is, you know, we've had a four year cycle of some players is, you know, try to get them to come back and be involved and speak to our team. Um, you know, I'm pretty close with some guys that played with us uh, our first year in 2017 when I was the offensive coordinator at that time. So I've been at Douglas since, you know, the school wasn't even finished being built yet. Um, so I've been from the infancy stage where we had 13 guys and now we're over 100 on the roster. Um, so, you know, I want to try to incorporate that a little bit more. Um, you know, at some other schools that we've been at, yes, I've had, I've had at, um, at Fairview High School, I had former guys come in and speak, some older players that may still be in the community. Um, I actually had my high school coach, Ivan McGlone, that recently passed away. Uh, he came, spoke to our team in 2012 at Fairview before we played in the state semifinals against Hazter. Um, and, and it was kind of funny when coach got really bad the last couple months and right before he passed away, um, I, right after the news broke that he had passed away, I had a couple of former players at Fairview uh, that text me and say, Coach, I remember when when he came spoke to us before, uh, you know, the state semifinal game. And I remember what he talked about and, and how we had to perform in those moments. And that was really neat for me that a couple of players would text me that and say, hey, I remember when Coach come talk to us right before that game. Uh, so I like to do that more and more. 
Uh, obviously at Douglas, it's been a little harder because we're a new school. Uh, but in, in some other positions that I've been in, that is part of the process I think is really important is try to get your alumni base to at least come back and participate uh, and be proud of what they've built there. There's, uh, there's kind of a, uh, this, uh, you know, it, it, it comes up at, at coaching conventions and you see it in social media and stuff. There's this, this attitude um, or maybe assumption is a better word about where the hot spots are, where the hot beds of high school football are. You know, you know, a lot of people talk about, you know, West coast, California, obviously Florida, Texas, um, uh, you know, every state that I have, I just recently saw an interview with coach Kevin Kelly, who's a, a very uh, successful head coach in Arkansas. And he was talking about Arkansas football being real strong. How do you think, uh, given the fact that, that in the public eye, Kentucky is always viewed or has been viewed much as a basketball state, if you will. Um, how do you view, you know, high school football here, given the fact that you've been at multiple schools here, plus coaching in Atlanta, having a chance to talk to these coaches in your, in your small group in other states? How do you view the, just the overall quality of Kentucky high school football? I think it's a lot better now than it has been in the past. Um, I think social media and the availability of kids being able to get their information out there has also helped. Uh, of course, we don't have the population of the South. You know, I think we're at like 4.4, 4.5 million people in Kentucky. I mean, when I coast in Atlanta, there's 7 million people that live in Atlanta only. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it's crazy down there, but, you know, just the population itself isn't, isn't there. So you don't have the plethora amount of athletes, but you have a really solid players in this state that, you know, if they're not power five guys, there's a lot of group of five at that next level under, and then obviously a lot of FCS kids. Um, I really think football has gotten better. I think part of that is, um, you know, we've able to have full cycles of spring practice, um, you know, obviously this COVID year is going to really hurt with development. I think we're going to see some, some issues with this for a year or two beyond this. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we'll adapt and we'll do better, you know, do the best we can as coaches. But, you know, I do think you're going to see that, that be a factor, um, you know, but, but kids will persevere and coaches will, and we'll, we'll do the best we can. Um, but I do think overall it, it is good. Um, you know, obviously, I've always heard about the basketball end. We know how important Kentucky basketball is at the University of Kentucky and how important and passionate it is. Uh, and, and high school basketball is important to the state. Uh, but in my opinion, football is much more popular now in this state than it ever has been. Uh, and I think that's because the country, you know, enjoys football. It's America's game for a reason. Well, I agree with you. And I think that uh... – uh, one of the reasons I wanted to go down that road is because, you know, like yourself, I've always been a football junkie, uh, you know, and for me, it's, uh, I think I've said it on just about every episode, but when I joined the army, all of the foundation of, of leadership and all the things that I learned uh, in high school and college football was what set the foundation for me in terms of my leadership development when I went into the army. And I think that while there are certainly a number of coaches out there uh, that still coach like they were coached. So they're very hard nosed. They're not necessarily into, you know, feelings. And, you know, I, I can remember my, my little league coach telling us during practice while we were running, drinking water during practice is highly overrated, you know, and, and those types of, and nowadays, I think as coaches, we much more understand from a child development standpoint, that if nothing else, kids want to know why. You know, and, and if you, and you might as well just get used to telling them up front uh, than than having to answer the questions. So when you look around the landscape of of that type of thing, that phenomenon, if you will, how much value do you put on the the athletes that you have in your program at Douglas or athletes that you've coached at other schools that choose to be and do you encourage being multi sports? So there is a variety of developmental, both physically and mentally. A variety of things going on with these athletes that will help them in their football careers. Oh, for sure. You know, I was a tri sport athlete myself. Uh, I played basketball. Uh, I was a screener rebounder. I got taken out of the game if I ever left the block area. 
<laughs> but it helped me with my football, with my athleticism, helped me with my feet. Um, but I was not a great basketball player. I, I did it because it helped me with football. And then I ended up um, going out for track, um, and I just kind of did it to stay in shape and lift weights uh, and ended up being really good in a shot put and discus. Hmm. Uh, I was able to win three state championships in, in, in two in discus and one in shot put. Um, and then coming out of high school, I actually had a few more track offers than I did football, but it was pure economics for me, full football scholarship or 40% track. I'm going to go play. And I wanted to play college football. Sure. Saying from an economic standpoint, you know, I played college football. Um, but I enjoyed every sport that I played. Um, everywhere I've ever been, I support guys playing multi-sports. I'm never going to tell a kid to choose. I'm going to support them. I mean, we have some guys on our football team that have football scholarship offers from Power 5 schools that are currently playing baseball. That's great. That's fine. Uh, I want them to do that. Um, but the thing is, is I try to get parents and athletes and really all multi-sport coaches to understand is if they're not lifting, I'm not saying they got to go in there and max out if they're pitching or or if they're, you know, getting ready to play a game or a match. But I think the strength conditioning piece is so vital for all athletes now. Um, you know, if you're not doing it, you're getting behind and you're not going to win. Um, so I think that's important, obviously, year round to make sure that parents and players understand that lifting is important. It's important for injury prevention for all your sports and to be in the proper, um, you know, mindset of you being a, the best athlete you can be. You know, I think that's kind of, you know, that wasn't necessarily always the mindset. And I think some coaches still don't have that mindset, which to me is wrong, in my opinion. Uh, you know, people can disagree with me if they want. That's okay. Um, but I, I feel like that piece is really, really important nowadays versus maybe 15 years ago. Well, Coach, I'm right there with you. I'm a huge proponent of, of being a multi-sport athlete. And, and, uh, you know, I played everything I could get my hands on as a kid. I was just a very average athlete, unfortunately. Um, but that's okay. I mean, it kept my interest. It kept me going, but I did track, played tennis, you know, uh, played baseball. And then once I got into high school, I focused just on track and football. And, uh, I, I know, you know, multiple guys and multiple coaches that, you know, love to have their big men wrestle, love to have, you know, their guys run track, their skill guys run track to help with their football speed and so on and so forth. So I, I think it's tremendous, not only that, but it's a different set of muscle movements and muscle memory. And I think that the diversity helps you develop once you do start to specialize. Let's say you go to college to play football. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I just think it makes a huge difference. Um, at the, Early in the outset, when you talked about speaking with your new freshman class, and, and it's a little bit of a disadvantage here, obviously, like you talked about with the Douglas being a new high school, fairly new. Um, but it, it did my heart good to hear you say parents, because I think I'm putting together a program right now that is focused on parent engagement at the youth sports level, because statistically, it is still true. And I first discovered this in 2010, that 70% of kids in the United States stopped playing youth sports by the age of 13. And uh, the three most commonly cited reasons for that are bad coaching, overzealous parents, and burnout from specialization, you know, with the advent of travel teams, whether it be AAU or baseball or whatever. So when you engage with parents as a high school head coach, um, what type of tact or uh, introduction do you give them and how do you work to keep them engaged and develop that relationship as their son goes from freshman to senior and, you know, you, you continue to have them. So you garner their support. Yeah. I mean, the first thing I always talk about with parents, and this is kind of something that my parents taught me at a young age and I'm very thankful for is two things that you're always going to get from me, whether you're a player or a parent or a coach or anybody associated with our organization is number one, I'm going to be as fair as I can be. All right, to to whatever that is. And then number two is I'm going to be honest. You know, I'm going to be fair and I will be honest uh, to, to the parents uh, about their about their their kid. 
uh, about the process of what they, you know, are going to go through in our program. And, you know, I feel like in our program at Douglas, you know, and I tell parents this as they enter into our program, it's a serious deal. You know, there's a reason why we've, you know, won over 40 games in the first four years. Yes, we've had talent. Yes, we've had good players, but that's not the only piece that matters. So I think being honest and fair as soon as the parents walk in the door with a new football player coming into our program, because it is a scary time for those players. I mean, they're going to be in high school for the first time. Um, you know, they're going to go from being at the top dog in eighth grade and probably one of the best players on their middle school teams to come into high school. So really putting that mind at ease uh, and building that relationship in our organization, for me, it's really hard with over 100 players now. Um, you know, we, we might have 115, 120 this year. It's really hard to check up on every parent every week. Uh, they got work. I got a team to run, uh, all that. So I think it's important you send general statements out on like a Remind app or something like that and just say, hey, are you guys okay? How you doing? Here's the information for this week. And I think that's important to the parents and the players and all the stakeholders. Um, and then you also have to deal with the fact that there's some players that their home situations are not very good. Um, and we have several of those situations like some other coaches uh, in programs across the nation. And I think building that relationship to where that grandmother or that uncle or that you know foster parent or whatever it may be, or an older brother, that you also build that rapport with them to understand, I'm going to try to get your son or your player to be the best person they can be over the next four years and make sure they're doing their grades and, uh, and all that is, is important. And, and to me, that's something that I value as a coach because there's a lot of trust in that. Yeah. I, I don't know that, um, you know, I've, I've heard when I was uh, the last time I was coaching in high school, I coached my youngest son at a small Christian school here uh, near Elizabethtown. And uh, it, it's you, you commonly hear the term, you know, helicopter parents, the ones that like to hover around and and, you know, be there for everything. And and I, I don't think that necessarily everyone is motivated by something that's bad. In fact, typically it's the opposite. They're motivated by wanting to take care of their son, sometimes too protective, uh, you know, that they're afraid to let him fail. And I think that's one of the things that's so phenomenal about a program like you have built there and are currently expanding is that, you know, you, you have a, a tradition that you're working from and you have a great methodology that you employ that helps, you know, bring those parents in. And hopefully there's a lot of, you know, uh, uh, horizontal, uh, relationship building uh, among parents as well. And, and that helps you, especially when you have some good, strong parents to, to, you know, be, be the leader, so to speak. Well, coach, I, uh, I want to kind of wrap this up, but I wanted to give you uh, a chance, whether you're talking to an incoming freshman at Frederick Douglass, or you were, you know, thinking back maybe to uh, the time when you were closing in on uh, your senior year or during your senior year at Marshall, and you had, you know, recruits coming in and doing visits. And I'm sure that like most colleges, they uh, from time to time had guys that would have been playing in your, you know, position group come to talk to you and stuff. Um, what would you, if you were going to share with someone else, uh, you know, whether it be either of those groups, what would you share with a young man playing football or thinking about continuing to play either, either at the high school or college level in terms of the overall social and, and individual benefits from the game of football based on the fact that you've spent your whole life in the game? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and before I forget, I want to thank you for your service in the military. So well, thank you. That was my pleasure. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, it's the greatest game in the world. It's the greatest team game, you know, and, and you know, Urban Meyer talks about nine units strong in his book uh, of champions. And that that's so accurate. Uh, and the thing about football is every position is so specialized. You know, linebackers do something totally different than defensive backs. Defensive backs are going to be something different than, you know, the linemen. But at the end of the day, it's 11 guys building a relationship with each other 
that they got each other's back and they're trusting that other person to do their job. Um, you know, and I played other sports and no offense to other sports. They're great. I don't think you get all of that in other sports. I think you get that with football. Um, you know, a wise old English teacher, you've probably seen the quote, uh, and I love to, I love to post it sometimes on my social media, but, you know, she talks about how football is really the, the last true discipline sport left in, in the United States of America. Hmm. Um, and, and she talks about how it's just the ultimate team sport. And this is coming from just an, a high school English teacher. I don't remember uh, necessarily who her name was, but I see that quote brought up on social media from time to time. And, and it's so true. Um, you know, there's a reason why everybody doesn't play football because it's hard and you fail. Um, you don't, you know, even if you win a lot, there's going to be times you don't. Um, there's going to be, you practice a lot more than you play games, which is not the case in other sports. You learn the preparation. Uh, you learn to, to work for 10, 11 months for 10 opportunities. And then you try to earn the rest of them going to a state championship. Those are all things that help you in life. The reason, one of the major reasons I, I like coaching and I go into it is I want to repay the game because I can never give back to the game what it's given to me. Um, and, and that's the truth. Uh, the game has taught me so much. I was blessed with great parents and great family. But the game of football is endless on life lessons. You know, and, and our four core values at Douglas are accountability, um, honesty, character, and discipline. Well, those four things are life things, but they're also four things that help you win football games. Uh, and when you have teams that buy into that, you know, the sky's the limit, especially when you have talented football players. And I feel like that's one thing we've done at Douglas, uh, multitude of things. But we've got our guys to buy into that. And when talent buys into those lessons and all that, then you have a great chance of being successful. And I think football teaches us that in life. And I, I know there's a lot of safety things that parents are worried about. To me, the game is the safest it's ever been. I mean, pretty much everybody has trainers now. There's concussion protocols. There's things that in place now that, that we as coaches, uh, really our hands are tied. Uh, and it's the safest it's ever been. Um, I encourage parents to allow their players and sons an opportunity and children to play the great game of football and continue to move forward to help our game expand because it is very popular and it's going worldwide. Well, I'll tell you what, Coach. I, I, I think that is a, uh, an absolutely awesome way to, uh, to end the show because there's nothing I could say that's going to express – that any better and I feel the same way you do I, I much to my wife's chagrin I think uh that she she knows that I'm planning on trying to coach again down the road and uh, if nothing else I'm going to coach my grandkids so uh, that gives me motivation to stay in shape and and uh and do what I have to do but coach Nathan McPeak uh, Frederick Douglas Broncos in Lexington Kentucky uh, thank you so much for taking the time out of your evening uh, to be with us on For the Good of the Game. Uh, much continued success. Uh, obviously, you're, you're building a great program there, and uh, I'm sure Douglas will continue to succeed. But as you said a minute ago, either way, you know, you you win or you learn. And uh, I, I think that's one of the blessings of this game more than anything else is that uh, every different time you come up against an obstacle, it presents another opportunity to become a better person or a better football player or a better coach. So thanks a lot for being here, and uh, take care and good luck. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me again. I appreciate what you do. Uh, and you guys have a good night. All right, coach. Take care. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye.